a shoot in Taiwan at like 10.30 at night, and I went in the bus tunnel, and there was this army of kids just like this, who just got out of school at 10.30 with their lunch pails and going home. 10.30 p.m. They're going to eat us for breakfast. <laughs> they are really smart. Here's the night market. You know, it's open all it's just 24 hours. You buy live snakes and you know sneakers and tires and bestsellers and anything you want. So here's our architecture. This is the tallest building in the world until Burj Dubai got it. This is Taipei 101. It's like the world's biggest pagoda, right? And I, I looked at it and I said, "Are you kidding me?" Here's the the sensitive. Chinese motif that's like three stories high because it's up a thousand feet in the air and you can't see it. Okay. All right, uh, I want to go to New York really quickly and then wind up. Uh, let's see, Taiwan on the left and New York, Canal Street on the right. So I actually think Taiwan looks better. But you, you can't ignore the Canal Street for what it is. And, and that's the kind of vernacular, our version of vernacular architecture. Boy, is it, it hums. That is unbelievable. So here's the, this is the old New York stuff. This is all gone now because uh, the, the Louis Vuitton moved in. Uh, you know, it's Soho, all right? But they're beautiful buildings. And, and there's the, that's my New York. That's the, the, this is from the roof of the Met. So it's over this, the Olmstead Sea of Green, and then the gray, right, the gray masonry graph, bar graph. Campbell calls it the bar graph of power. Right? I'm, I'm taller than you, and you, I'm bigger, I'm better. It goes across. All right, so here's the guy. I want to talk about some Frank Gehry architecture in New York. So when, when you start to talk about architectural theory, Gehry shows up at these conferences at Harvard, and they, and they ask him about postmodernism influences on metaphysical influences of uh, time and inflected digital media. And he goes, I like fish. <laughs> and they get, they get, at Harvard, they get really mad. <laughs> and, he, and he used to sit in it, he's a kid, and his parents bring home his gefilte fish and the carp, and they got to swim around the tub, so he watches them, and they, he has a great time. Okay? <laughs> so here's his fish in 1992 for some, I don't know, Olympics or something. I think it's in Barcelona. And then here's the one he did in uh, Bilbao, which is really, really a great place. Amazing place. And here's the one in, uh, this is on the West Side Drive in the 20s. It's, it's, I think it's the IAP building. This glass is bent, cold bent into these compound curves by workmen on the site to fit. You know, it's like, you know. And, and the glass is, is fritted. It's printed with like white dots so that that it, it reflects sunlight and, and it has this, it looks like a, kind of like a donut with, you know, glaze on it, you know, baker's glaze. It is, it is the most luscious looking building I've ever seen. It's just stunning. So, like, a block from this building is, here's, like, and this is two weeks ago, this is the High Line, which is the old railroad that sits between, I like, 10th and 11th Avenue, and it, it's 100 feet in the air and it goes for a mile from like Gainsworth Street up to 40th Street, something like that. And it's now a park. It, it's, it's such a New York thing. It's like only there could they have the imagination and the money and the, and the smarts to do this. You're walking on the rooftops, so you're up above everyone. Right? They're, they're, this is, these guys are smart. Right? It's really a fantastic place. See the posers and people in black. And it's, it's got everything. <laughs> okay, we're leaving vanity now. Um, this, is the, this is the big message for the night. Uh, uh, decorated sheds, you know, Venturi, you know, you just, you know, architecture is a box with decoration on it. You, you put stuff on it, like columns or pediments, you know. All right, so here's the problem, this, okay? Uh, uh, Banda Ache and, and Haiti and Sichuan. Okay? And it's not the earth, it's the crappy architecture that does it. Here's, this is stolen from a guy in the audience, I'll introduce you to him in a second. 77% uh, of the world's architects are here. 
And, and guess what? 70% 70 of the projects that need to be built are not here. You see where I'm going with this? Um, this is a hospital designed for a hospital in Rwanda that I'm lucky to go take pictures of next week. And here's Clinton, and the guy on the left is uh, Paul Farmer, Partners in Health, another hero of mine. They're breaking ground. And here's some of the, the people. Partners in Health is a, is a, is a unbelievable, they're the smartest people on the planet, okay? They, they get the prize, right? Here's a, a rendering of the, of the hospital. It, they realize that hospitals are places where infected people gather in a dark hallway and cough on each other. <laughs> and they get, all get sick. So they, they flip that around. And, and here it is under construction. Uh, this is the, these guys. Uh, yeah, and there's the real building, I think. And I'm going to stop. Uh, the, the guy who's doing this is what? It's Michael Murphy. Stand up. Yeah, yeah. And, If you want to talk to him about it, he's the guy. Fine. Uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. So uh, our next uh, our next uh, speaker is, uh, is is Paul Lucas, uh, an expert on suburban. Uh, uh, community planning and, le and lectures across the United States, Asia, and Europe. Having worked in the field since 1978, he has extensive experience in a wide range of building types, including multifamily housing, universities, airports, subway stations, urban retail centers, factories, interiors, and residences. I don't think I've left anything out. Uh, please join me in welcoming Paul Lucas. Thanks very much uh, to George and, and, and to Dean Bluestone, I think this is a great idea. This is the way the university should be. It should be open to the city, and there should be a constant dynamic uh, flow of ideas and exchanges between different realms. Um, and to George, uh, we'll have to trade notes, because uh, I just got back from China with my students. Um, I took 15 students from Washington University, my visiting professor this year, um, to expose them to some of the issues that we're talking about this evening, and to give them a flavor of that. And in the spirit of uh, Peter's discussion, Maybe somebody gets a door prize and they figure out where this place is, <laughs> specifically. Beijing. Yeah, it's Shanghai. Do you know what street it is? Could you turn the mic off, please? Sure. Do you know what street it is? Oh, God. Well, it's Nanjing Street. Um, and what's interesting about Nanjing Street is it connects the People's Park, which used to be the polo grounds for the British when they had concessions. Um, uh, organizing most of Shanghai, and it connects it to the Bund. Um, and so this is a place that's very much about globalization, um, and it's represented over the last 150 years. And it's very much about, I think, about how the Chinese have figured out how to assimilate and integrate other influences uh, over the generations and make it in the world their own. And what we're going through right now is this process of getting all of these different influences and trying to accelerate the development of a country uh, basically transfer 200 to 300 million people from the hinterlands to urban areas in the process of about 20 to 30 years. And that's creating a very interesting dynamic. So what I did is I had my students get off the plane late in the evening and we got on a maglev train that goes about 450 kilometers an hour um, and uh, get off in the station in Shanghai and from there it just gets swept away by the sea of humanity. And Literally, if you don't follow each other, you will get crushed and you will be part of the pavement. And luckily, we had uh, one of our uh, students is a center for Kansas State, or Kansas University, which was a national champion. Believe it or not, he gave up basketball for mother architecture. A really bad dream, I told him. But he did save us that day, because I just stood next to him and everybody followed him. But so what I want to talk to you about today is uh, my own global uh, architectural excursions in this issue of um, globalization. And um, in thinking a little bit about this topic, uh, and I thought about it, without trying to give a definition of what globalization is, I think globalization implies the transfer of processes, information, ideas, technologies, um, and, and markets. 
And it does so in order to create a more unified field uh, for future transfers of similar items, information, capital, and culture. And I think the operative word here is transfer. And the question is, how does it happen? What is the medium? And who are the agents of globalization? Uh, and luck luckily for us, this 70% issue that we talked about in this previous slide, architects have been agents of change and this transfer of information over the last uh, 15 years in China as we're trying to figure out how to accommodate 200 to 300 million people in these new urban centers. And um, I've been very lucky to be part of that process in some very small way uh, over the last four to five years, partly by accident. And what I want to do this evening is just share with you uh, a project that we, are, um, that we designed in Hangzhou, China, which is a very beautiful city that Barry knows all about. Um, and then just, if we have time, just share, you, share with you a couple of images and vignettes of uh, images I just took when I was in my most recent trip. Uh, so about four or five years ago, I was teaching at uh, uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing and was invited to teach it, um, give lectures at other places. In the process, I ended up meeting a number of developers and, um, and then we ended up asked, being asked to, to do different proposals and ultimately got a project, um, which was a really special project, which I want to share with you. It's called the Jindu Sustainable Pavilion. And the idea was that this developer um, wanted to uh, build a special project that was part of a larger housing complex. So they build these amazingly large complexes. They build a thousand units of housing at one time and literally it goes up in, in a matter of a, a, a one year. Um, and the site's located in the city of Hangzhou, which uh, Marco Polo referred to as one of the most beautiful cities in the world when he went to visit it. Um, and it's a, a small to medium-sized Chinese city of four to six million people. Um, and it's growing rapidly. Uh, but what it's claim to fame is the West Lake. Um, and it's this beautiful lake. Uh, it has mountains to the left of it, or to the west of it. To the east is a, a, a bay to China, and a river to the south. And this place is as close to paradise as you can get in terms of its location and geography. And it's grown to become a very prosperous city. Um, and there's just, this is an amazing place in terms of being able to observe change and transformation. So our client asked us to develop um, a, a prototypical building to, to demonstrate their interest in, in sustainability. And that means many things to many different people. And you can imagine through translation, some things get lost. Um, but the, they, they were very sincere in trying to uh, address the real issues that they're recognizing as being, uh, that they're facing in their culture. So the idea was to build this small building, 50,000 square feet, in the midst of this thousand unit housing complex. And it was, you know, so in th thinking about being an agent or, uh, of transfer in this process of globalization, uh, we just feel incredibly lucky and fortunate in that in the process of transferring information about technologies and ideas um, that we encountered and wanted to share with them, uh, we also in the process learned more, I think, through uh, our exchange and our, our discussions with them. Just to give you a sense of the site, uh, this is a typical uh, uh, kind of development that you'll see. This, these are the large housing complexes, or the large housing towers. Um, and this is the tradition of how cities are built now um, in China. And they all tend to face south, and that's because all the rooms have to uh, get enough light. And what's happening, unfortunately, as the land, uh, as the development pressures on the city and the developers are getting greater, the towers have to get taller. And in order for, to get enough light into each one of these buildings, you have to have at least two hours of sunlight into each room. The buildings tend to get farther apart. So it's a real challenge to try to take this architectural language, bird internationalism, and try to fuse it with the realities of, of the Chinese context. Um, our site is uh, located in the midst of this context. We also designed the landscape in front of it. And in fact, when we first went to the site, um, we got to see, see it under demolition. And they were literally blowing the site up as we were walking through the site. You know, things are explosions going off, dust going everywhere. Nobody was worried. No OSHA here to worry about it at all. Um, and what's interesting is that they, all the materials are reused. So here you can see how people are actually stacking every brick, every tile. And that got us thinking about how we can, for instance, reuse some of these materials. So as part of this transfer of, uh, of uh, ideas and technology, what we did is we set up a team of about 10 to 12 um, scholars and academics from Harvard and MIT to develop a whole set of ideas or, or, or um, I, uh, references and concepts that could be exchanged with our colleagues in China. And then we would go over there and have these meetings with 
30 of their experts, our experts would share information with them. We created these big documents, they love these books, uh, full of information about the latest concepts and technologies that pertained, that could possibly pertain to this project. Based on that, then their team picked a number of the uh, um, technologies and concepts they thought would be most apropos for their project, and then we began to use those as a building block for the design. Part of that, of course, is looking very carefully at um, issues of environment. So there's a lot of studies done as related to the environment, looking at new kinds of technology. So it's very much trying to be exposed to the latest concepts and ideas, figuring out how those could be appropriated and applied. And that was an interesting process to figure out which ideas and concepts were most likely to fit. And some of that had to do with economics, some of it had to do with market, some of it had to do with um, preferences that the client had. Um, and so what we came up with is a, a design that tried to pick up on some of the references, and I'm going to show you later a city, that, a, a beautiful village that we saw, Hongsung, which influenced uh, us very much. Um, but we tried to work within the constraints of the, of the program that was given to us and develop this recreational building and uh, a sort of demonstration exhibit space. And so this building has a number of different programs in it, including um, a running track, a swimming pool. It has, they love VIP. Uh, Dining, food is so important in China. Uh, it's probably as important as, 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 as many other things in life, as you might imagine. Um, and what we did is develop this cross section where the original concept was really to think about this, the, the, the pool as being some sort of vessel of water and because of its symbolism of renewal and so on in culture, and that it was elevated by these two arms and rose from the ground and was renewed and nurtured uh, through a number of different devices. And the running track would then circulate around it and then exhibit spaces would be down below it and the park would come in and, um, and feed lower spaces down below. And meanwhile, there were all these other technologies that were designed to be tied into this project. Um, and then the roof is also related uh, to the same kind of uh, profile as exists in the, um, in the pool. So this is a diagram of how some of the spaces work and how they're integrated. And as we were developing the design, I should say, actually the first sketches for the design were developed as we were sitting in a, a boat, which had a small little restaurant uh, on it, um, overlooking a, a farm that was about 5,000 years old. People were digging up artifacts as we were um, um, uh, doing the design with the, with the president. And meanwhile, there was somebody running around looking for a chicken and so for, for dinner, and they literally referred to it as, do you want to have running chicken? Which means it's very fresh because the chicken is running. So, anyways, here's a cross section that incorporates some of the systems. Um, and you know, some of the systems are more sophisticated, advanced systems that are recommended by our engineers, but some are actually things that we saw inspired by what we saw in China. So, for instance, I saw these large tubes uh, running across the landscape and asked what was what are those things? And those are basically large heat ducts and pipes that would transfer heat from one source to another, whether it was a factory or something. I knew there was a factory down the street, so I said, look, why don't we just reuse that and help keep the pool? So you know, in this case, in some ways, we were using ideas that were already there, they were latent, but trying to find ways of, of making it unique, in particular to this place. And these are sketches of the pool and earlier design developments are showing what this pool would be like. In fact, here is the sketch that we did um, uh, on sitting on the boat, watching the running chickens and the excavators digging out pots 5,000 years old and some of the other follow-up sections. But a lot of this was really inspired by tours and visits of local villages um, like Hongsung and other, which I'll talk about shortly. And in the end, what we did is we, we developed a, a very complete design, uh, fully modeled uh, using Rhino and other kinds of technologies, 